Hi, okay, in the last lecture, I gave you some information about membrane potential and how, and we led up to the idea of equilibrium potentials. The idea that if you've got a cell membrane and you allow one particular ion to cross it, that ion will go down its concentration gradient until we get a membrane potential that acts against that diffusion and puts that ion into equilibrium. Which it tells you that for any given situation, let's just make a cell here and put some sodium around it. For any given situation, I can determine what ENA, what the equilibrium potential for sodium in this case, or any other ion would be. Now, to figure out what the number is, you'd have to use the Nernst equation. And I'll look at that in a little bit here. But just right now, let's talk about what you can figure out just by looking at this. So if, I, if the question was, tell me about ENA. This can get really tricky because we're not usually, we as students at this point are really almost never used to thinking about something like this. This is a weird abstract concept. So let me give you some strategies to think about this. When I say tell me about ENA, what I think it, in your head, think I want to know about, there's two ways of looking at it. The voltage which would put sodium into equilibrium. So ENA is the voltage at which sodium is in equilibrium. Or another way to look at it is the voltage I will get if only sodium crosses the membrane. Those are two different ways of looking at equilibrium potential, but they will both lead you to the right answer. So let's approach, let's look at it with both of them. So first let's use the first one. ENA is the voltage at which sodium is in equilibrium. Equilibrium means that sodium is not crossing the membrane overall, either inward or outward. Now if I look at this, diffusion would be pushing it inward. So what I'm looking for, if I'm looking for ENA, is a voltage which would push sodium back. I'm looking for this. That is ENA, the voltage which would put sodium in, into equilibrium. Now, sodium is a positive ion. So if I want a voltage that's going to push sodium out of the membrane, which side would have to be positive and which would have to be negative? Think about that for a moment. Try to come up with an answer. Okay. If I want sodium to get pushed out of the membrane, then I want it to be repelled from the inside and attracted to the outside. Since it's a positive ion, I would want the outside to be negative and the inside to be positive. If there were that voltage, it would push sodium out. So, is that a positive or a negative voltage? Remember the way to do that. The inside is mm, compared to the outside. The inside is positive compared to the outside. So this means ENA is a positive voltage. We don't know how many millivolts at this point. We haven't done the Nernst equation. But I can say that it will be a positive voltage. Now, let's look at the other way and see if it gives us the same answer. We look at this and say, it, ENA is also the voltage I will get if sodium alone crosses the membrane. So which way will sodium tend to go? Well, down its concentration gradient is inward. So if positive sodium goes into the cell, that makes the inside more positive and makes the outside more negative, which will then act to push sodium out. Same answer, two different approaches. So in that, that also says ENA is positive. You can use either of those. For some students, this way of looking at it makes sense. For others, this way is easier. This one makes usually is a little faster for me. I can look at this situation and say, what's ENA? Well, which way is it going to go? 
inward. Positive ion going in makes the inside more positive, so ENA will be a positive voltage. That meant that if I started at zero and I allowed sodium to cross the membrane, the membrane would become more positive until it reached ENA, which would be some positive voltage. Now, let's apply the same logic to a different situation. Let's look at EK. So, in this case, I want to know, tell me what you can about EK. So use the same two ways of looking at it. EK is the voltage which would put potassium into equilibrium. Which way does potassium tend to diffuse? Which way, what voltage would I need to stop that diffusion? Think about it, try to solve it. Pause the video for a moment. Okay. If I wanted to stop potassium from diffusing, in this case, diffusion is outward from high to low. To get a positive ion to go inward, I need it to be attracted to the inside and repelled from the outside, which means I would need this. That is EK, and that is a negative voltage. EK is negative. Let's approach it the second way. EK is the voltage I will get if only potassium can cross the membrane going to tend to go outward. Positive ion going out makes the inside more negative. If I lose positive charges, the outside becomes positive, the inside becomes negative. Again, EK is a negative voltage. So notice, the equilibrium potential for an ion depends on which direction it's going and the charge of the ion. And those are the only two things it depends on, the concentration gradient and the charge. Now, let's take a look at one more way, of, one more thing. Let's bring both of those ions in here. Sodium and potassium. Now, if I look at this situation, what can you tell me about EK? Okay, it's just the same as it was before. I'm going to use the second way because that's a little easier for me. Potassium would tend to go out. Positive ion going out makes the inside more negative. So EK is negative in this case. Tell me about ENA. Again, using the second method, sodium tends to go in high to low. Positive ion going in makes the inside more positive. So ENA is positive. The voltage which would put sodium at equilibrium is a positive voltage. The one which would put potassium at equilibrium is a negative voltage. Those are not mutually contradictory. This is a th and this is a thing that often makes students confused. So let me address probably the most common misconception about this. If I said, tell me about ENA, it is very tempting to say, all right, ENA is the voltage from sodium. There's more sodium outside than inside. Sodium is positive, so there's more positive stuff outside than inside, so it's positive, negative, so ENA is negative. If you were thinking that way, that's totally understandable. That's a very, very common approach this, but it doesn't work. Equilibrium potential, in fact, almost always in membrane potential, it's easiest to think about it about saying what will happen with this ion and what will that do to the membrane potential. So if I want to know about ENA, I'm not actually looking at where the charges are right now. I'm looking at what will the charges become if this is allowed to diffuse. And sodium will tend to come in in this case, and that will make the inside more positively charged. Now, the other issue students have with this, which is a totally legitimate one, is to look at this and say, but you said these numbers don't change. 
So if sodium's coming in, but this number is still greater than that one, then isn't the outside still positive? It would be if these were the only ions that were there. But you shouldn't make that assumption. In fact, unless you are told otherwise, you should assume that a membrane starts out very close to having equal charges. In other words, if I gave you this with just positive ions, you could reasonably assume that there was some amount of negative charge that came very close to balancing all this out. You could imagine, for example, that there was 110 millimolar chloride on either side, which would make this just about equal. Then, if I open a sodium channel and sodium starts coming in, it takes it from being zero to being a little positive inside. I won't usually draw the balancing negative charges, but you can assume that they're there unless specifically told otherwise. The short version of that is, just remember, it's not about where the ions are now, it's about what their movement does to the membrane potential when you're talking about equilibrium potentials. All righty. Now, before we go on, let's talk about the Nernst equation for a moment. If I wanted to know what actually is the membrane, the equilibrium potential for sodium in that case, how would I do that? So this is something called the Nernst equation. And I will not ask you to solve this equation. You will not have to do this. But for some people, seeing the math behind it can help them a little bit. Now, if you are a student who, when I say math, says, never mind, and stops the video, don't. It's very common for students to have some level of fear associated with mathematics because it's weird and uses symbols that, aren't, that don't make, seem to make sense, and people assume that they're not good at it. And you shouldn't make that assumption. Math is about the relationships between things. It's a way of sort of formalizing those relationships. So really, when I draw you the Nernst equation, all I'm showing you is a way of showing how several things are related to each other. Don't worry if you don't know how to solve it. Don't worry even if it doesn't make a lot of sense. Just kind of open your mind to it. So Nernst equation is that the equilibrium potential for an ion, some ion we'll call x, is equal to the number 61, don't worry where that comes from, divided by z of x, which is the charge of the ion, times the log of the cons this is the concentration of the ion outside divided by the concentration of the ion inside. If you haven't had or don't remember logs, this symbol, log of this, just means what power do I have to raise 10 to to get this? That'll probably make sense if I actually show you a solution for this. So, I'm going to move this equation out of the way. So this is e x equals 61 over z x log x out over x in. Now, let's look at the situation we were looking at before. Sodium 110. First, before we go on, practice what we've just been doing. Tell me if E N A is positive or negative. Pause the video and try to think of that. Try to figure it out. Okay. E, which way is it going to go? Positive ion going in makes the inside more positive. So we know that E and A should be positive something. Let's use the Nernst equation to figure out what. So E and A equals 61 divided by the charge of sodium. That's one positive charge plus one. So that's just. 1. 61 divided by 1 times the log of the concentration outside, 100, divided by the concentration inside, 10. All right, so this is 61 divided by 1 is 61 times the log of 100 divided by 10 is 10. 
10 to what power is 10? 10 to the blank is 10. If, that, if you're not familiar with that, don't worry too much about it, but it's 1. So equals 61 times 1 equals 61. E and A in this case is positive 61. The units there are millivolts. So in that case, 61 millivolts with the inside positive, outside negative, is E and A. That's the voltage which would stop sodium from moving. It's also the voltage you would get if you allowed sodium to cross inward until you reached an equilibrium. So on our little voltage chart, if that's zero, that would be positive 61 millivolts in that case. All right, now, something I want you to notice about the Nernst equation. What does EX depend on? It depends on two things, the charge of the ion and the concentration ratio. That's it. ENA depends on the fact that it's a plus one ion and the fact that it has a 10 times concentration gradient. That's all it depends on. If I started here and then added a bunch of potassium, I put in a bunch of potassium here. Has that changed ENA? The answer is no. ENA depends on charge of sodium and concentration ratio for sodium. It doesn't depend on any of this. Now I could figure out what EK is, but ENA is still positive 61. That is the voltage I would get if only sodium was allowed to cross the membrane. It's important to remember, ENA is just a mark on a voltage chart. Let's put a let's make a voltage scale here. So this is Vm, here's zero. In this cell, ENA is positive 61 millivolts. That means if the voltage is here, then sodium will be at equilibrium. It also means that if I allow only sodium to cross the membrane, that's where the voltage will tend to go. It doesn't mean the voltage is there at any moment. This is a little bit like speed limit. On, the on a particular stretch of freeway, the speed limit is 65. That's just a mark on my speedometer. It says if you're on the freeway, don't go any higher than that. It doesn't mean I am going 65. I could be going more or less than 65. It means that's where the speed limit is. Likewise, the membrane potential in this cell, Vm, might be above positive 61 or below it or at 61 or somewhere, it could be anywhere. That's just, if it's at that point, then sodium will be at equilibrium. And if you allow sodium to cross the membrane, it'll tend to go towards that point. But that's all that means. In this cell, what can you tell me about EK? Positive ion going in makes the inside more positive. So EK is also gonna be positive. How positive? Let's see, EK equals 61 divided by the charge of potassium, which is also plus one, times the log of concentration outside divided by inside. Now, for a moment, think about something. Do you expect this EK to be more or less positive than that? Will it be more than positive 61 or less than? Conceptually think about it, what is EK? It's the voltage I need to stop potassium's diffusion. Potassium tends to go in like sodium, but does it tend to go in more or less strongly? Look at the ratios. Sodium is a 10 times ratio. It's, there's 10 times more of it outside than inside. What about potassium? Two times. It's not as much. The slope isn't as hard, which means it doesn't have as strong a tendency to go in, so if I wanted to stop it, I don't need as strong a voltage. I will still need a positive voltage, but not as much. In other words, I'm gonna predict that EK will be more than zero, but less than positive 61, somewhere in here. Let's figure it out. So, this is equals 61 times the log of 100 divided by 50 is two. 10 to what power is two? I don't, I can't do that in my head. I'm gonna to have to get my calculator out. So, I go, 2 and log to base 10. 
0.301. Let's just say 0 0.30. times 61, that's about 18.4-ish. There's EK. Again, just another mark on my voltage chart. EK is the voltage that would put potassium in equilibrium. If I'm at EK, if I'm at positive 18.4 millivolts, potassium won't be moving out of the direction. Will sodium? Yes. 18 millivolts is not enough to stop sodium. You'd need 61 to stop it, which means sodium will be slowly drifting in. You just don't have enough voltage to stop it. And that will change the membrane potential. That'll be bringing it in, making it more positive, bringing it up this way, which means we're no longer at EK, so now potassium starts moving. So where, at what voltage would they both be at equilibrium? can't do it. There is no voltage that would put them both at equilibrium. It's not, it's not possible. So that's an interesting situation. So what you've learned right now is that equilibrium potential for an ion depends on the charge of the ion and its concentration gradient. With the charge and the concentration gradient, even without the Nernst equation, you could tell me is it going to be a positive or negative voltage. And if you had two of them, you could tell me, even if they're both positive, which one will be more positive. The bigger the ratio, the stronger the voltage. So ENA will be more positive than EK because sodium has a bigger concentration gradient. And, you've, and if you are okay with the math, you've learned that you can calculate the equilibrium potential and that it goes with the, it goes with the logarithm of the ratio. Um, don't worry about that right now. We may touch on that later, but I will never ask you to solve that. So what we're going to... Oh, and the last thing you've learned, and this is an important one. The equilibrium potential for an ion is just a mark on the voltage chart. It's the voltage you will tend to go toward if that ion can cross the membrane. And if you're at that voltage, that ion will be at equilibrium. And if you're not at that voltage, it will not be at equilibrium. So those are some things you've learned. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is going to talk about what happens if more than one ion can cross the membrane at a time? Because that's going to lead us into the first topic in the nervous system, which is resting membrane potential, or actually the first membrane potential topic. So let's cover two, more than one ion at a time, and then we'll be done with the core concepts. All right, let's consider the case where you have more than one ion that can cross the membrane at a time and what that will do to the membrane potential. Now notice, we're not talking about what it will do to equilibrium potentials. Those are going to stay the same as long as the concentrations don't change. But the actual membrane potential that you measure at any given moment, that's what we want to look at here. So let's draw up a cell and a voltage chart. So here's zero. And let's put sodium here. Now, we found that if sodium had a 10 times concentration gradient, that Nernst equation said that ENA was positive 61. Now, let's, in this case, use chloride. Let's give it the same concentration gradients. Now, in this case, see if you could figure out what ECL will be. You don't actually need the Nernst equation. So take a moment. Think about which way is it going to go, what will that do to the membrane potential, and what's its concentration gradient. Okay, so when I look at this, chloride's moving in, so negative ion moving in makes the inside more negative, so ECL should be a negative number. We know that in sodium, a 10 times concentration gradient made it have 61 millivolts for its equilibrium potential, so for chloride, 10 times concentration gradient should be 61 millivolts as well, but it's negative 61. ECL should be negative 61 millivolts. All right, so we know that if I opened a sodium channel, sodium would go in, taking the membrane potential up here, and then when it hit positive 61, sodium would be at equilibrium and we would be done. And we know that if I had a chloride channel, then chloride would come in, making the inside more negative, bringing it down here, and we'd hit negative 61, and we'd be at equilibrium. 
So what if I have a chloride channel and a sodium channel? What if I have more than one ion that can cross the membrane? Well, let's see. If sodium starts coming in, that pulls the membrane toward ENA. So that's going to pull me more positive, but chloride coming in pulls me more negative. And if I look at this, they have the same concentration gradient, so they have the same tendency to move. So if sodium, for every sodium that moves in, a chloride moves in, what happens to the membrane potential? As far as I can tell, if a positive ion and a negative ion move in, how has the charge changed? It hasn't. In other words, if I started at zero, I'm going to stay at zero as equal amounts of sodium and chloride move into the cell. So what's going to happen? Well, because remember, if it was just sodium, sodium started moving in, but after a little bit of sodium moved in, we built up a 61 millivolt membrane potential, and that stopped any more sodium from moving in, which meant these numbers didn't change. Same for chloride. But if it's both, and both of them are moving in, so the membrane potential is not getting to ENA or ECL, neither ion is in equilibrium, and they will both continue to diffuse, and now those numbers will start to change. Over time, as, some, as sodium and chloride both move, eventually these start to go down, these start to go up, and those concentration gradients start to change, which will change the equilibrium potentials. Remember, those depend on the charge and the concentration gradient. So in that case, we're never going to get to equilibrium, at least not until the, the equilibrium potentials change. So in that case, Vm, the membrane potential, stays at zero. Now here's another way to look at it. Every sodium channel I have causes the membrane potential to move toward ENA. Every chloride channel causes it to move toward ECL. If I have one of each, they're both pulling on it, which means it'll stay, and since there's just one of each, they pull equally, which means it stays in the middle, right at zero, which is what we thought. So this leads to what I would recommend is a way to approach how to think about what happens to membrane potential as you open or close channels. Every time you add a channel for an ion, you cause the membrane potential to get pulled toward that ion's equilibrium potential. Every sodium channel I add pulls us toward ENA. Every chloride channel pulls us toward ECL. So imagine, for example, that I have a situation where I start with one of each, so my membrane potential is pulled equally, so it's right in the middle, and then I suddenly add a bunch of sodium channels. Every sodium channel pulls toward here, so now I've got more places for sodium to come in. It can come in faster than chloride can leave, so the inside becomes more positive. It pulls it toward ENA but it won't get all the way there because I still have some chloride channels letting these negative ions in, keeping it from getting too positive. So I'll end up somewhere here, maybe. Now, I'm not, still not at equilibrium for either ion. If I'm at, say, positive 40, sodium is still coming in. Slower, that positive 40 is holding it back somewhat, but it's still coming in. That positive inside is drawing the chloride in. It's coming in even faster. So what I'll do is get to a membrane potential where the slow inward movement of sodium is balanced by fast inward movement of chloride. Slow through four channels, fast through one channel. Once those are balanced, my membrane potential will stay stable. I'm not at equilibrium, but I'm at a steady state. I'm at a stable membrane potential, at least until those ion gradients start changing. So that l sets us up for what you'll need to know to understand how we're going to use membrane potential in the nervous system. Membrane potential is hard. Spend some time on it. Practice these things. There are some practice problems online. Keep doing it until you can solve the problems on your own. It will take a while and you will get them wrong for a long time in all likelihood. Don't be discouraged by that. That's a normal part of this process. You can do it. There will be questions on the test about this, so it is worth your time. So spend some time with that. And when you get end, if you run out of practice problems, let me know and I'll send you more. All right, you can do it. I'll see you in the nervous system lectures.